Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and this is your February to-do list. It's a little late, but it's still February, so you have time. Um, So joining me, because this is also a question-answer episode, is Joe. So, Joe, say hello. Hello. Oh, that was a little loud. Okay. Yeah. Say hello again, but a little bit lower. What have you been doing for like the last few weeks? I know. We haven't recorded a podcast in a while. Yeah, watch the we. We, (laughs) um, Lots going on at work. Just been going through and um, getting rid of a lot of plants at work. I post them when we put them behind the conservatory and people come like, like vultures and just take them. We begin rid of our terracotta pots because we're moving to plastic and we... They're just, it's amazing putting things out there and people just swarm. Why are you moving to plastic from terracotta? Um, Just ease of maintenance, ease of swapping stuff out. Yeah. And it just, it's square pots, plastic pots. They sit better. They're lighter, um, easier to clean. So yeah. So that's, that's the, the main reason. Um, So yeah, a lot of stuff at work, just cleaning up. And of course, slowly I'm I'm working in my garden you know it's been raining so much and I just sort of look outside and I'm like oh but you know my my vegetable garden's all set for winter crops are going along summer crops are being planned and then I try to remove the um passion vine that I was trying to I knew I was going to remove it because the passion vine just went crazy and as much as I want passion fruit and I like the flowers it just sort of took over so you grew a lot of kale this year. I did. Yeah, that's good. I'm eating that every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of broccoli. You bring that in a consistently. Good amount of cauliflower. Good cauliflower. It's enough where I can't keep up with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. You sound like that's a bad thing. No, I said it's I should good. Br- I could bring it to work. I should bring it to yeah, work. Yeah, why don't you? Because I'm like, look at Joe. I grew all this for you. Don't you want to eat all this broccoli and be bloated? <laughs> I can bring some to the gym if you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, so yeah, just just and of course inundated with cats. We're uh, up to twenty two. Twenty two? I thought it was more than that. No, twenty two. Twenty two. Yeah, we're holding steady at twenty. Okay. And then one of the gals, lady who adopted two of my kittens, yep. um, she's had cats before. All of a sudden she came down with allergies and she tried. She has an autoimmune disease. She ended up in the emergency room twice. And she was hoping, but she just couldn't. She, I felt so bad because she really was attached to these cats. So now we have them and I have to rehome them ideally together. I, I buy the allergy thing. Remember I was telling you the other day, like. Yeah, you're telling me about. Of, yeah, out of our inside cats. Some of them, nothing. Yeah. But at least one of them. Are you going to drop names? Which Which cat? Which cat makes you I, allergies? Uh, be- Which one? Which one? Beetle Joe? goat's fur makes my eyes itch like crazy. If I touch my eyes, I have to wash my hands. You're talking about your baby beetle yeah, I know, goat? I know. Yeah. Beetle goat who could do no wrong? Queen beetle goat? Well, it's not wrong. Her She's majesty. obviously the outlier. That's special. Wow. That's special. Yeah. Wow. I wasn't expecting to. Well, you say what that. I'm saying is I buy the allergy thing. Yeah. I think you can be specific. It I think different specific. cats have different. I don't know, allergens on their fur. Yeah, because I had another kitten return and a lady had a Russian blue and she's like, I'm allergic to this cat. So, you know, I'm never going to fault anyone for saying. But the funny thing is, is your mom's never had a cat. She was always like, I'm super allergic to cats, super allergic to cats. She now has a cat, not allergic. No. Doesn't seem to be too bothered by our cats. That one uh, has really long fur. Yeah, but she doesn't seem to be too bothered by ours either. Yeah. 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 So I think you could grow out of your allergies. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, this is not a cat podcast. Once again, I always have to remind people, even though you want me to start one. I do. All right. So let's talk about February to do. Um, parts of the country 
apparently it's just turning winter with a lot of like back east didn't have a lot of snow and now it's snowing. Man, I couldn't handle that because today was finally 60 degrees and I'm like, okay, yeah, please. Can we go back in time? I'm going to pull so many episodes Mm -hmm. where you are, it's the middle of summer and you're like, you know, I just think I, it's, I need to move probably to the Northeast. It seems like it's really nice. Joe, I need two homes. (laughs) Joe, I need a summer home and I need a winter home. You need a summer home and then like an asylum home. (laughs) I think I like this two home idea better. Sounds much better. You could have two gardens, two. Anyways, so remember, I'm coming at this to do list from zone nine. You could be in a different zone. So double check your tasks because this is zone nine. We are warming up. It's still been cold in the morning. It's been a cold winter. Um, we're still down in 30s where I'm at. And then today got up to 60 and um, flowers are starting to bloom. What It was cold this morning. Frozen. Yeah, it was. That's what I said. Yeah. I've had, if it hasn't been cloudy, I've had ice on my car window every single day. I can't even open my door in the morning when I get, get up. That's because you get up. It's blizzard. frozen shut. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So February to do. So yes, we're sort of in that strange area between uh, winter crops and uh, summer crops. But in zone nine, interesting fact is you could do your second round, or if you missed the first round, um, the other round, this could be your first round of planting broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower as plants in your garden right now. So you could do that as long as well as Swiss chard by seed or plants, collard, same thing, seeds or plants, kale, loose leaf lettuce, peas, and radish. So if you missed out on broccoli or want more broccoli, <laughs> Joe, more broccoli. Uh, hey, you yeah. know what you didn't grow this year? Those what? giant radishes. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. Um, I don't know why. I just didn't. What are they? Daihatsu? Daihatsu. <laughs> Daikon? Yes. <laughs> I didn't plant those radishes that also drive you places. <laughs> no, I, you're right. I didn't. I also didn't plant leeks, which I'm mm-hmm. bummed about. No, I oh, I like, liked them because I, I put know. them in soup. I don't yeah. like leeks. Okay, so that's what you could plant in your vegetable garden now. What you could also plant is bare root fruit trees are still available and bare root roses. And a lot of nurseries, if they don't sell out their bare root, is they will then pot them up a lot of times in these peat pots. They will pot them up. So if you find those, you could plant them as as well. So um, it doesn't just have to be bare root. If you find them potted up, you could plant them as well. But right now, bare root season still going on. Prune roses. It's time to prune roses. You could do that now through March, really. And if you don't get to them, don't worry. I, I you know. I used to prune my roses every two years just because I get, didn't get around to them. It's a good idea, of course, if they're getting too tall to prune them down to remove the dead. Um, so prune roses right now. You could still prune your fruit trees. And so I did a pruning workshop at work because we have a mini orchard. And I'm looking at it. I'm like, I'm not going to get to this. And I'm not going to get enough students. Oh, I'll know what I'll do. I'll make a pruning workshop. I'll teach them and I'll make people prune. So we had about 35 to 40 people show up, which was amazing. And we got a decent amount done. I gave a a tutorial really focusing on your thinning and heading cuts and how to prune fruit trees. And I was telling people that you could prune fruit trees pretty much year round. You, a lot of times you drop the height in the summer. You do want to avoid pruning too much out in the summer because things that have been shaded are then exposed to the full sun. So really now is though is a great time because it's easier before they're leafed out to prune them. Of course, always leave a few days of dry. I pushed it and I'm like, okay, do do as I say, not as I do. But that pruning workshop, it was dry in the morning and then we had rain at night, but we went with it anyway. So ideally, you know, a few days of dry when you prune. Start cleaning up your garden if you already haven't done so. What that means is anything that was acting as a blanket for frost damage. And I'm going to hold off a little bit because we're still having cold temperatures. So remember all that old foliage on your frost sensitive plants acting like a blanket. But right now you might start seeing new growth sprouting from the base of some of your perennials. And that is a time to cut the old foliage off top. And, you know, I got a question about grasses. Grasses is always hard. 
Um, when do you prune it? Well, the old foliage on a lot of these ornamental grasses, it's beautiful. And then you cut it and they could take a while to start sprouting up for the base. So what I would do is I would leave that foliage as long as you, you know, until it looks ugly and not as pretty as it looks, and then cut it down when you see the new foliage coming up from, from the base. You could start dividing stuff. And that what I mean by that is um, some of your grasses, things that are still dormant, dig up, agapanthus, buy your dahlia bulbs right now. Dahlias can be planted anywhere from March through May. Plant your sweet peas, plant your perennials, frost sensitive plants. I still will hold off a little bit because last year we got a really late frost that affected the almond blooms and that wasn't till like the end of February. So hold off on planting frost sensitive plants. And starting seeds inside of your tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. So that's, this is probably about the earliest you would want to start them. You know, seeing online, some people even backies are starting them super soon. And I'm like, what, 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 what? Peppers, of course, you know, could take a while to get going and you want them robust to put them out. Um, but tomatoes, if you plant too soon, they're just going to get very tall and, and leggy. So right now, though, is the earliest time to plant them inside, sow them. So tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. So you could, you know, start, start thinking, start getting a few rounds of them. Obviously too cold outside right now to start them. But if you want to be early, early, go ahead and plant those inside right now. And I think really that is it. Some of your succulents are starting to be active growing. So that's the time to transplant. So anything in a pot that's starting to push out its active growth is a really good time to transplant because it recovers from transplanting much easier, especially your succulents. But of course, always wait to water your succulents, your succulents in. And always do this, you know, always watch the, so the soil. If it's sopping wet, if we just have a heavy rain, you don't really want to dig in it. So let it, let it dry out a bit. But yeah, there you go. Your chair is squeaking. It doesn't do it on command. No, no, I tried. <laughs> okay. Didn't do it. All right. Yep. You ready for questions? I'm ready for questions. Okay. You feel that you adequately covered February? Yeah, there's always something like, did I forget something? What should I be talking about? But yeah. You didn't really build any new uh, structures this year. No, I'm, so I'm actually going to taper the garden back a bit. <laughs> uh, Joe, I never say that. Every year I say I'm going to add. Or do no, I, no, no, do no, I no, say no, I'm no, tapering no. the garden back a bit? Oh, my God. You, you realize this is episode 170. Uh-huh. Oh, you, is it? It is. Okay. Do you want me to count how many times you've said, you know what, th this year, this year, I've decided I'm tapering my garden <laughs> back a little bit. Um, but this year I mean it. This year, I really mean it. Promise. And why? Why are you taping the garden back this year? Because I'm trying to do more hiking and backpacking. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get into back to my first, well, gardening has always been, but hiking, backpacking has been right there. And not to say you can't have a garden and do that. I just, you know, it's a little more maintenance. I just, right now, I'm I, springtime, I want to be able to be out there and, and not be like, oh my God, I should be planting this. I should be laying this irrigation down. So yeah, when you've been gardening as long as I have, you know, certain things come in, you know, it's like, okay, this year I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, All right, let's, my an eyes. let's answer some questions. I had white fly and aphid problems last summer. Do I get rid of all my soil and all of my garden boxes? I had tomatoes, zucchini, and bell peppers. No. Did, oh, sorry. Me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so sorry. Continue. Finish. It's from Lily. Okay. No. <laughs> and the reason being is um, white flies and aphids do not overwinter in soil. There's a lot of other pests that do, um, but I would never get rid of the soil on pretty much anything unless I had a nematodes uh, a root not nematodes correct bing 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 very good Joe um you if, think I don't pay attention at all yeah yeah um okay white fly aphids do not overwinter in soil it's not to say they can't overwinter 
Your aphids definitely could overwinter as eggs and sometimes adults on surrounding perennial plants. So say you get rid of everything in your garden, your summer crops that they're attacking, they could be hiding out in perennials all around, not in your soil. So there's really not much you could do. I always tell, I mean, technically right now you could still spray a dormant oil on deciduous and even evergreen plants, but I wouldn't even bother. So aphids to me generally are not a problem. If they attack small plants heavy, yes, a small plant could be affected, but generally they dissipate, natural predators come to them, a hose blast works. White flies, that's another problem. White flies are notorious for being very difficult to uh, control. And they do like cucurbits, they do like zucchini, they usually come spring and fall, but they could be seasonal. They will overwinter, but really the cold sort of kills them off a bit. Um, so they're going to overwinter as only one stage under the undersides of certain leaves as well. So they're going to be they're going to be overwintering as well. So for aphids, I'm just going to say if you see an outbreak, hit it with a hose. Let natural predators take control. Remember, look for those beige uh, mummified bodies with the exit hole. And to know that natural predators are taking control. When I mean natural predators, I mean parasitic wasps um, are one of the major ones that you won't even see to the naked eye. White flies, if you know you've had them early on, preemptively spray with a hose blast, preemptively use a soap spray. You could do reflective um, material. So think foil, but you don't really want to go buy all that foil and lay it down. So you could even buy clear plastic and spray paint it with silver. They apparently don't like that reflective material. So lay that on the bottom of your newly planted plants. Hang sticky traps around because sticky traps do control. So it's just as constant um, monitoring early on and constant trying to keep the numbers down because the life cycle is so quick. So you may spray and say, wow, I killed a whole bunch of these adults, but there's more. That's because their eggs, their nymphs are under the leaves. We do release, I do release uh, parasitic wasps in the greenhouse, but parasitic wasps out and about in the garden aren't necessarily going to stick around. But I did try them last year. It's Encarcia, E-N-C-A-R-S-I-A, Encarcia formosa. Um, you could buy them from Arbico Organics. If you release them in spring, you might get them a little bit established through the summer. They won't last through the winter. I'm not sure. I haven't, I, I, I released them, but it was late and I didn't really see. So if you want to play with that, that's fine. But really, it's just they're, they're tough. They're tough to control. But no, don't get rid of the soil. Hose blast question. Yes. When you say hose blast, uh -huh. do you mean with a gun? Ideally, yes. Okay. So today at work, we have a mealybug outbreak. And I'm down to 99.9% .9 not spraying. Um, I happen to get my beneficials, which are this cryptolamus beetle I bring in, but I needed to get the numbers down on the cycads. So I took a hose with the gun and I just blasted the cycads, which have very sturdy leaves and could handle that and knocked a whole bunch of mealybugs off. Young plants, plants with thin leaves. Yes, it's going to cause more damage. You may want to go more gentle and do a rinse. So it's plant by plant basis, but when I say hose blast, generally it is a hose blast. Um, even certain plants that we'll take out at work that are potted up, move them outside, lay them on their side, and we'll get the underside of the leaves, tops of the leaves. If we damage and destroy some of the leaves, you sort of look at how many can you allow to be damaged and destroyed. But yeah, a new little like cucumber plant with, you know, five leaves, that's going to be tough. I would do a soap spray on that then. So you said you're 99.9% .9 non-spraying now. Yeah, but Joe, you know math is not my strong point. So approximately. Yeah. What is, what is the delta? What is the change? Um, I'm bringing in beneficials. No, no, out I, of... I get that. What did you start at? Were you spraying 50% before, 90% before, and you're now at not spraying 99? Do you, not, you don't follow my question. Well, <laughs> compared to what I was... Yeah, your initial state. Yeah, my initial state. Yeah. Yeah, my initial state. Yes. Which is hard to explain what I was spraying. 
You know, so when I took over spraying, we were spraying about once a week, once okay. every other week. But were you spraying all the plants or no, a portion? No portion. Twenty percent, forty percent, fifty percent. Good. I didn't know this. I'm was a just map saying. Pot. I'm curious Ugh. what. Oh my goodness. How much the change has been? It, it sounds like you're so barely much. spraying now. Yeah, lot, lots of change. Lots big, of change. Big change. Big change. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> Joe, you promised there'd be no math. There's no math. That's I was math. Just, you could have said 28.7%. You knew I would be lying. <laughs> but Joe. Joe, twenty eight point seven percent. Good. Oh, so it's been a, yeah. a very it's big change. Really good. It's really wow. worked out. That's for impressive. Me. Thank you. Thank you. I yes. just did that number really quick in my head. I like the data that you've gathered. You know over what? The years. I, I data is my favorite thing. Data, Excel sheets, databases, math, data. Last year, I thought I heard you talk about putting chicken manure and alfalfa pellets in the garden. When and how do they get applied? Should I move the wood chips before application? Also, we are careful about keeping an organic vegetable garden. Should we buy organic manure and pellets, or does it not matter? Joanne. Okay, so we'll start with first things first. When I prefer spring and fall, um, you could do it any time of year. I just do it spring and fall. Bef like, if, ideally, I would do it now for my summer crops. Because um, you want it to work into the soil. You want it to break down. You want it to be available for the plant. So if I do it now in February, the idea is, is some of those nutrients are now going to be available for the plant, say, in um, late April, May. And yes, you do want to move the wood chips away. So move the wood chips away because you want to ideally incorporate both into the soil. You can do a top dressing. But it's going to take longer to work into the soil. So say you lay just like chicken manure on top, it's going to take, you know, irrigation time for that to sort of leach in. Same with the uh, alfalfa pellets. So ideally, if you could turn it six inches down into the soil or even further, that's ideal. So that's what I, I would do. Um, and as far as organic or not, um, if you are truly organic, yeah, you know, there's chicken manure. You know, chickens, I don't know if they, I think they do can treat them with um, antibiotics. They can treat them with certain and feed them certain foods. So if you truly want to be an organic garden, then yes, look at chicken manure that is from an organic source. And same with alfalfa pellets. You've heard me say alfalfa pellets. You want to make sure there's not molasses if you're buying them from a feed store. Now, chicken manure is a pretty strong nitrogen fertilizer. Apparently, sheep and rabbits or the other strong nitrogen manure. So if you have sheep and rabbit. Um, so you want to use that sort of sparingly. And I think the rule of thumb is like 20 pounds per, oh, what is it? Like 100, um, 100 square feet, something like that. But what I usually do is just get a bag and I, you know, might raise beds that are like four by eight. I just sort of lay like a layer on top. And mix it under. You never want to plant directly into it. You never want to use new fresh manure. And then alfalfa pellets, I do the same. I lay them sort of on top, just a thin layer, and then I'll turn them under. And it's alfalfa is a mild fertilizer. Um, the ratios for I always forget what this is, so I do have a cheat sheet here. Is the um, I can't even find my cheat sheet notes right here. Can't even find it. Three, two, one. <laughs> so it's 3% nitrogen, 2% phosphorus, 1% potassium. What? Huh? Were you laughing at me? Well, that combination of numbers, I, I mean, it's tough to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you had your cheat sheet. <sighs> Joe, if it was one, two, three, I could remember, but that three, two, yeah, one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Really? That sequence, just where did <laughs> it come from? Joe, that really tripped me up. <laughs> NASA called. They're looking for a new countdown girl for the <laughs> rockets, but. Where's my cheat seat? Man, where do they start at? My cheat seat? <laughs> Where's my cheat? Where do they start at? What, what do you mean? Their countdown. Does it start at three? No, it starts at 150. Oh, well, forget it. <laughs> it doesn't start at 150. It starts at 10. Forget it. I can only do three. Two, one. Three, two, one. 
All right. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. That means the percentage. But interesting fact is for chicken manure, chicken manure has all 13 essential nutrients that all plants need. So it's actually really good. That's why it's a good. And when people ask me, oh, do you fertilize? I say, no, I don't fertilize. I add this to my soil before um, or twice a year so that I don't have to fertilize because it, quote, feed the soil. So that's what I use. But yeah, move those wood chips away if you really are worried about organic Um, then go ahead and try to find an organic source because, of course, you know, the chickens aren't organic. That is being passed on. All right. Okay. That was an interesting answer. Three, two, one. I know it's not the best time of year, but my mom passed away last month in this bird of paradise plant. It's your favorite question. I can tell already. Uh, It's my favorite question? The... The, the plant question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this bird of paradise plant was at her house that she loved. What's the best way to transfer this plant from one house to another without killing it? Ryan. That's my favorite question. Okay. I mean the whole like inheritance I, I, of a yes, plant. Yes. I know what you were going to yes. say is like someone passed away. They gave me this gift plant. Yes. Now if I kill it, I'm going to feel super guilty. Exactly. Yes. So I tell everyone, yes. always buy flowers, not a gift plant. Right. Because um, I did have to answer one of those earlier today. Um, this one, it sounds like an established bird of paradise plant. And um, so February, it's a good time. So bird of paradise, even though they look very tropical, they actually tolerate cold temperatures very well. So you plant them in you know, a tropical garden. You're like, wow, look how tropical, but they handle freeze. It's just fine. So I'm comfortable having you do it in February, digging it up. Um, Ideally, the bigger the root ball, the better. But the nice thing about Bird of Paradise is you could actually get a pretty small root ball on them and they're okay. The other nice thing about it is you could divide them. So if you're digging and you only get a small portion of it and you can't dig up the rest or it breaks apart, Just take that small portion and start it. So that's how you even make them smaller is you could actually divide them. Some tricks on trans digging them up is, and this goes with like palms and cycads as well. You could always remove some outer leaves to make it more narrow to be able to dig it up. You can also take a bungee cord and tie up all the leaves so they're not in your way. And then, of course, moisten the soil if it's super dry. Wait a day or two and then just start digging. And like I said, the nice thing about bird paradise is they're not particular about the size of the root ball bigger is better and then when you go to plant it you know wider is better don't dig any deeper than the existing uh, root ball you don't want it settling in use the same native soil this goes for pretty much any plant take out the native soil put it back in and then water it once and then you know if we get some rains you won't need to and then you know water it sparingly once it's um you know They don't need a lot of water once established. So that's it. So it's very doable with a bird of paradise. All right. Doable sounding. Apricot question. Barbara, my apricot tree has little holes. Is it going to die? Okay. Um, Does she mean the tree itself or the fruit? I'm imagining tree. tree. Yeah. Yeah. So a few things that could cause holes on your apricot tree or apricot tree as you said joe i did yeah mm-hmm. yeah. yeah it's a variation of a loquat <laughs> oh good i bet it tastes yummy um okay boars could cause little holes they're very little holes it's almost pinpricks and you would notice sawdust at the base not all boars will cause holes sometimes it's under the bark that will be the holes so sometimes for boars you know you pull some bark off and the holes will be in the wood and the sawdust will be below the bark. It's not unusual, but it's a little more rare to see the holes directly outside of the bark. Usually you see bark being loosened, then you pull it back and you see these holes and you see sawdust and you're like, okay, that's boars. So the fact that you just saw them um, makes me think that it might be sap suckers. Um, Sap suckers are a woodpecker type. I'm not a bird person believe they are a woodpecker and what they're doing is going after the sap and they leave so this is how you know you have sap suckers versus like a a standard woodpecker going after insects is they're in a complete 
very equal line. They're all line, very, very organized birds, very organized birds. That's like very linear and organized. So it'll just be like a hole right next to each other. And there could be rings of them. They could be very destructive. They could cause death to a tree because what they're doing is girdling the tree. And what girdling means is basically cutting off the flow um, from the roots to the main part of the plant and it's not getting nutrients, water. So yes, if you have a whole bunch of holes, Depending on how big your tree is, depending on the percentage covered, um, your tree can die from it. When I, when people send me pictures and they're like, hey, I, I'm starting to get these holes, I tell them to put that metal flashing around their tree trunk because even if the wood, the sap suckers come up and hit it, they're not going to get into the tree and it can sort of prevent and allow the plant to heal. Woodpeckers will cause holes too, but they're going to be larger and they're going to be sort of random. Um but they could also be destructive. But you have a whole bunch of little holes lined up. I'm guessing it's sap suckers. What is the best fertilizer for <laughs> orange trees? This is from Hardeep. Okay. So generally well-established citrus trees aren't going to be lacking too many nutrients. So just like any tree in the ground, any perennial in the ground Usually they almost don't need fertilizer. If you do a mulch on top, that's going to be great fertilizer. It's going to work its way in. Um, citrus can run into some problems. So the number one nutrient that citrus usually lacks is nitrogen. And you know that when the leaves start turning yellow. From the edges inwards, they will move yellow. The lower leaves will turn yellow. The whole entire leaf plant could be pale yellow. Now that's usually from lack of nitrogen. However, that could be not necessarily lacking nitrogen in the soil. It could be it's getting too much water. It has something to do with the roots and the roots aren't even taking up nutrients. So a lot of times when you have a stunted tree circling roots, rotted roots, you'll also have a stunted tree with yellow. It's because it's not taking up the nitrogen that's in the soil. So adding soil to nitrogen to the soil isn't going to help. But say you have a healthy tree, had a heavy crop, you're coming into spring, the new foliage, all of a sudden you notice this yellowing. Nitrogen moves to new growth. So in spring, when there's new growth being put on, you'll notice this sort of movement of nitrogen where the older leaves are turning yellow, but you have a new flush of green. So you could give it nitrogen. Um, because that is showing that it might have a little tinge of uh, lack of nitrogen. Almost always it corrects itself though. Um, magnesium can happen on citrus. Usually I never see a lack of magnesium in our clay soils. It's usually yellowing, moving from the outwards in, and then some curling of the leaf. So that could be a magnesium uh, deficiency as well. If you have high pH, you could have maybe some iron deficiency. That's where the veins are green and the rest of the leaf is yellow. So in when in doubt, go ahead and give a complete fertilizer. And a complete means that it just has all the macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Generally, you'll also have some sulfur too, which helps drop the pH. Um, a balanced fertilizer is like a 5-5-5, five, 10-10-10. Five, five, ten, ten, ten. So for citrus, I would go more on the nitrogen side. I would do like a 10-5-5. Five, five. And you want to actually do it sooner than – I mean, this is a problem. You sort of have to sort of think, okay, did I fertilize it last year? Did I have a problem? Let me go ahead and fertilize it now. So now is a good time to fertilize your citrus because it will work its way in. And by the time the foliage and the flowers start – It'll be in there. And then you could also fertilize sort of in May and June as well. So that's it. So a lot of times citrus don't need it. If you see absolutely no problems with it, it's in the ground. You Especially if you had compost around, you don't need it. If you are running into problems, generally it's going to be a nitrogen deficiency, but also check to see if you have a young one and there's some root issues, lack of growth, and then possibly it could be iron, could be magnesium. There you go. All right. You know everything about oranges now. Last question. Yes. My dragon fruit plant is covered in red circular spots and appears to be turning yellow and dying. What can I do? Okay. So, we have, so we have a dragon fruit at work. What is a dragon fruit? It's a fruit and it's a dragon. <laughs> no, it is actually a cactus. It's a climbing, oh. um, it's a climbing cactus. It actually climbs. Um, that's where you get dragon fruits from. And 
it is a lot of people think, oh, they're tropical and I can't grow it. I've had one outside in the back patio forever going through winter, never water in the summer. Is it growing like it should be? Heck no. But is it surviving? Yes. Uh, at work, we have multiples of them and they just grow like crazy up and scramble. So they could get quite large. If you see these like arbors where people are growing them up and over, pretty phenomenal. Um, so they're fun to grow. They're a nice cactus. But like most succulents and most cacti, when you get into really wet conditions, they could be affected. So our ones at work, I was just looking the other day and I'm like, oh, you're not looking so good. We've had a lot of rain. And what happens is fungal infections take hold. So if you have these red spots, brown spots, um, that is a fungal infection. Um, sort of like think of a leaf spot, but obviously these are on stems. It's really wet. And it will dissipate, not saying those spots will go away, but the new growth won't have them once it dries out and warms up. It will take care of it. In the meantime, you want to try to keep the plant as dry as possible. So if you have it in a pot and it's getting inundated with rain and hit by rain, do move it to where it won't get hit by rain because that, that's part of the problem. If you have any mushy sections, so go and feel parts of the stem. If it's really mushy, you need to cut that off because that's internal rot that could move all the way through the plant and kill it. Um, so right now our dragon fruits look like crud. They're yellowing. Some parts are mushy. Um, there's spots everywhere. But if you have a big enough plant, it will overcome it. You could use sulfur, a, it's a, a fungicide. You can spray a sulfur or do a sulfur dust and it will kill the spores on it. Do it when there's some dry weather so it adheres to it. Um, but yeah, as long as that's not mushing out, your plant's going to be okay. And then, you know, as it starts pushing new growth on those, those scabs and those spots will heal. Um, and then you could cut off sort of the mushy spots whenever it's a good idea to, as soon as you see the mushy spots. Yep. All right. Yeah. So that's it. Is that all? That's it. Okay, so if you have a question, you could email me at MarleneThePlantLady at gmail.com. Also, you could just um, direct message me on Instagram, which is MarleneThePlantLady. Follow me on Instagram and Facebook. If you like this episode or the podcast, please rate and review. I know on Apple, you could leave a comment, and that's nice to hear a nice comment and five star. And I know on Spotify, you could just do a, uh, a rating of five star and that moves you up the charts and allows more people to see the podcast. And with that, more people will be um, more confident at, at growing and they'll hear more about my cats and hear more about my math skills. Right, Joe? So until next time, everyone, happy gardening.